And welcome to Grocket TV GMAT lesson number two. Thanks all for joining us. Let's uh, see how many people we have here with us. How many people do we have here with us today so far? 90 folks. Awesome. Um, if you can take a second here while we're getting warmed up to tweet about it, we'd love that. We'd love to get some more people uh, watching. We're going to give everyone a couple more seconds here and we're going to get started in just a moment. Alright, so today uh, we are going to get a, do a little review of what we did last week. Uh, we're going to jump into a basic GMAT intro and as well as taking a look at some data sufficiency questions, um, some basic number properties as they're tested on the GMAT. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump in and get started. So as usual, you guys can follow me here. Uh, just to remind you, my name is Farb Nivy. You can follow me on Twitter if you have any questions. It's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Just tweet me at Farbood. Um, also, uh, this week we're uh, running a promotion. Um, anyone who tweets about the class using the link on this page uh, will uh, uh, be giving away a, a free set of downloads to one person this week. So if you get a chance sometime today, uh, or this week, go ahead and tweet for us and you might uh, win a free set of downloads for the course. Um, so let's go ahead and review. Everyone get ready to start, start typing into the comment box. I want to hear your answers. This is a little uh, you know, pre-quiz to see if you remember some of the stuff from last week. Um, so assumption questions. Remember we worked on assumption questions, uh, we worked on weakened questions, and we worked on strengthened questions. So when we're IDing the question on assumption question, everyone use the chat box, tell me what sort of language. Remember we said there's specific language that lets us know what type of specific question type we're working on. So everyone tell me, whoops, everyone tell me um, what type of uh, language we see on assumption questions. We should see some derivation of the word assume, right? We should see some version of the word assume on these question types. Um, go ahead and type in, how do we break down the paragraphs on assumptions? We, we learned last week that there's two flavors of question type, uh, two flavors of paragraph type on critical reasoning questions. What flavor does assumption have? Do we, uh, does it read like a story or do we look for the conclusion, assumption, and premise? That's right, so for these questions we're looking for a conclusion, assumption, and premise and we're testing the answers. Um, let's go ahead and I don't want to write that all out. So we're looking for the word assume, we're looking for conclusion, assumption, and premise. We're asking ourselves must this be true for the argument to make sense and if we negate the answer the argument should fall apart. Let's go ahead and take a look um, at an example um, right now. This is actually a pretty difficult assumption question. Uh, let's go ahead and read it the question first, we always start with the question. This conclusion is flawed, so we might be thinking it's a flaw question, which we'll get to in a later critical reasoning class. But uh, if we keep reading, we say, because it makes which of the following unwarranted assumptions. So we know that these are a bunch of assumptions down here, and it's our job to identify uh, which is the one. So go ahead and take a moment uh, to uh, read this uh, paragraph and break it down. So for a conclusion, we should have something along the lines of ad costs will increase, ad costs will go up um, because the reason given is that famous dictators charge more. Famous dictators um, charge more than impersonators do. So again, we're just sort of breaking down the paragraph on our own, on our scratch pad on the GMAT. Um, and let's take a look at these answer choices. We need to find the answer choice that must be true 
for this argument to make sense. Remember last week we said watch out for language. So here's this word most listeners. So whatever the logic of this answer choice is, it must be true that most, not some, not half, not less than half, but most, which is more than half. So let's read. Most listeners cannot distinguish whether a speech is being performed by a famous dictator or an impersonator. Must this be true for the argument to make sense? Um, I don't think so. I don't know why this would have to be true that most listeners cannot distinguish um, for the argument to make sense. So we can get rid of that one. How about B? Ads which use famous dictators are often um, we don't know what often necessarily means. It doesn't say more often or anything. It just says often. More effective than those which use impersonators. Um, okay, so this says that they're more effective, but we're sort of talking about cost on these questions, right? Uh, we're talking about cost. So I think we can get rid of this answer choice as well. Um, some famous speeches. So here's some language. Some famous speeches. Not all, not most. Um, but some famous speeches, original versions, cannot be licensed for commercial use. So does this have to be true that some famous speeches, original versions, cannot be licensed? Let's hold on to this one. D, booking agencies will continue using impersonators in place of famous dictators. Well, this is saying that the ads are going to go up because dictators cost more. I don't see why it must be true that they will continue using impersonators. So. Let's take a look at E. Advertisers will want to use original speeches. Um, so original speeches done by the actual famous dictator. So I have these two answer choices. I know that the, one of them must be true for the argument to make sense. It's the assumption. Um, and we can test it by negating it. So let's negate E. E says advertisers will want to use original speeches. So if we negate it, we would say advertisers will not want to use original speeches. Well, if it's true that advertisers will not want to use original speeches, then they can just use impersonators and ad costs won't go up. So when I negate this answer choice, it seems like the argument falls apart. Let's try C. Some famous speeches, original versions, can be licensed for commercial use. Okay, so if they can be licensed for commercial use, I don't know what that means about whether or not the prices will go up. Um, so we are talking about situations where we're um, getting the original famous dictator to um, perform their uh, rendition of a well-known trademark rant. So I think we can get rid of C. We verified that E does cause the argument to fall apart when we negate it. Let's pick it and see what we get. Nice. Great, so when you're, if you're practicing in Grokit, you can always take a moment here to view the explanation. Most of them are pretty detailed. We have an explanation of the question here and the explanation of the answer choices here. Um, great. So let's move on. Let's talk about undermine or weaken questions like we called them. Um, we ID the question by looking for language like following if true plus some negative language. Again, we're looking for conclusions, assumptions, and premises. And we're asking ourselves, if, the, if this was an additional premise, would the argument be worse? Let's go ahead and try one. Let's see here. So we have the argument to the left is most seriously weakened by which of the following. So let's go ahead and break down the paragraph, go ahead and read it to yourself and break it down. I'll give you a few. So this is saying, therefore, legislation will result in the loss of exports. And the reason is, is that um, this new legislation will drive up the cost of uh, the, the price of cars um, and that will reduce the exports. So we want to find an answer choice that, remember, like we said, if we added it to the premise, would it make the argument weaker? So, A, if, if, in, if in addition to the fact that 
um, the, this, the price of cars will go up. We also know that most countries to which U.S. automobiles are exported have recently enacted similar legislation, then it seems like their prices might go up too. I'm going to hold on to this. It seems like it might weaken the notion that exports will decrease because if other countries are experiencing a similar increase in the price of cars, um, it should all even out. Let's take a look at B. Non-compliance with the new legislation can be punished with high fines. So if in addition to the fact that the price of cars will go up, you can be punished with high fines, will that decrease export? Not sure how it fits in. Sounds like an FYI. How about C? Training factory workers to use the new technology required to manufacture compliant automobiles will be expensive and time consuming. This is just sort of adding to the point that they already made that cars will, um, the, the price of cars uh, manufacturing will increase. So that doesn't seem to weaken the argument if we sort of added it here. How about D? If we add D as a premise, if it's also true that some Automobile manufacturers will choose to relocate their plants to other countries that do not have stringent emission standards. standards. Um, in addition to that, the price of cars will go up. Um, let's hold on to this one. How about E? Environmental groups have been leaning heavily on the auto industry to voluntarily institute such emission standards. If we added this, does it weaken the notion? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with it. Seems like another FYI. So everyone take a moment and look at E and D and type into the chat box which answer you think is right, A or D. Let's see what people have to say. Do we have any answers yet? No answers yet. So in D, it tells us that the legislation will result in the loss of many export markets. And here, it tells us that some automobile manufacturers will choose. We're not really sure what this means. This could mean that um, some people will lose their exports and some will not. A, if we add it to the list of premises here, lets us know that if other folks are in, enacting similar legislation. They should experience a similar increase in the price of their cars, and that should flush out for us. Let's pick A and see what happens. Nice work. Great. Let's take a look at um, support or strengthen questions. And if we remember, these are pretty much just like the weakened questions, just the inverse. So the only thing that's really different is that they say positive language instead of negative language. Let's take a look at an example. 